The beer bottle had beer still in it as the broken glass shattered all over the ground. They were riding with an open container. That was crime number one. So this is where I get to my part, what happened to me in Atlanta um, many years ago. And this was some time before MP3s became popular and everybody had CD cases and a bunch of CDs in their car. And that, that'll be important in the story in a few minutes. All right, so crime number one, a cop pulled me over and I was going seven miles per hour over the speed limit. But the blind spots in my privilege failed me. And although I was ready to just accept the ticket from the cop, I had no idea that he would make such an effort to escalate all that happened that night over me driving seven miles per hour over the speed limit. Pulled over, asked for my license and registration and proof of insurance. I was headed to a wedding the next day, and I bought a flask as a gag gift. Mistake, and apparently a crime if you're black. The cop asked, what kind of vehicle is this, and how could I afford it? He commented about it being expensive. He asked to search my vehicle, and I said no. He said, why, are you guilty of something? I said no. He asked if I had been drinking. For the record, everybody, I do not drink. I have no problem with drinking. I have no problem with people drinking responsibly or drinking, you know, drinking. I just don't drink. I just never have. It's just never been my thing. I just never wanted to experiment, taste it, nothing. So he, you know, he's questioning me, have you been drinking? So I'm, you know, I told him I don't drink and of course, they don't believe me. So, the cop asked what was in my package that was sitting on my passenger seat, and I said it was a gift. He asked what it was, and to get him to leave me alone, I made the black mistake of saying it was a flask. He said with an authoritative, with author authoritative excitement, that is an open container. And asked if there was anything in it. I replied, no, and he demanded to see it. I told him it was wrapped. I, you know, it was wrapped as a wedding gift. I have another cop incident with wrapped gifts years prior to that. So it was wrapped as a wedding gift, and I was going to that that I was going to that weekend. He insisted on giving, he insisted on me opening up the package and giving him the flask because he said that was an arrest worthy offense to have an open container. Once I got to the manufacturer's gift box after undoing the gift wrap, I gave it to him and he pulls it out, unscrews the cap and sniffs it. I said, I told you there was nothing in it. The cop says, he now has probable cause and tells me to get out of the vehicle. Immediately takes me to the back of the vehicle, handcuffs my hands behind my back, and frisks me aggressively. Let me set the scene for you. It's 1.30 in the morning in northern Georgia, about 70 miles north of Atlanta. After frisking me, he walks to the driver's side of the vehicle and grabs my CD case just before the rise of MP3s. I was trying to give you a, a timeline. The cop pulls each compact disc out and throws them one by one like frisbees in and around my vehicle. He's just flicking them, taking them out, flicking them as he's staring at me. Staring at me in the eyes and doing it. Throwing them all over the place. He's flicking them. The cop is... Let me back up to where I was. It's, it, was, it's, it was a large vehicle. It was a future year, meaning that today being 2020, the vehicle would have been a 2021. So it was a year ahead. Um, it was a Yukon XLT, extra long body. The cop is throwing and flinging my CDs about 40 of them, one by one throughout the vehicle, while he stared at me in the eyes to see if he could get a reaction out of me by him being antagonistic. 
He searched the vehicle through, hoping to find something. As he questioned me about a myriad of different drugs, he suspects I should be selling or at the very least using. All of his questions were and still are in a not applicable. He comes back to me at the back of the vehicle and stands directly behind me and says, he's going to frisk me again. He starts frisking me again. I remember later, later telling two of my friends the next day that it got weird. He said, spread your legs as he actively grabbed my legs at the highest part of my inner and upper thighs, pulling my legs apart. I asked, why are you searching me again? He said he didn't search thoroughly enough the first time. After frisking me again, he stood behind me asking me questions and specific detail about where I live since I had recently moved. I remained nonspecific in my answer about exactly where I lived. Then another police car came, and that car was not on board or in agreement with what the other cop was doing and had done to me when I told him all about what had happened. The newly arrived cop told the other cop to take the handcuffs off of me. The second cop also looked at me and shook his head in disapproval of what the other cop had done to me. But it also seemed like acknowledgement of an awareness of the patterns and routine that took place and he was aware of this kind of behavior and culture being business as usual. He did ask me again about what I meant when, he, when I said the cop frisked me a second time and it didn't seem right. I am not intimidated by the cops, but I'll admit I had trouble explaining to the other cop without getting angry and perhaps not conveying what I tried to articulate about what happened and how it happened. I, sh I think it made the better of the two officers uncomfortable, and he ended with asking the other officer if he, if he was going to give me a ticket. The other officer did give me a ticket for going the few miles over the speed limit. I went to court, and the judge was rude to me, and the police officer that handcuffed me was with a group of other officers laughing and joking the entire time in the courtroom, and when I left the courtroom, they were all standing in the parking lot saying, I'll see you around, laughing as they watch me leave the driveway. Yet the officer here in Logan, Utah, tried to convince me that my perpetrators, four to five guys stuffed in a Grand Am throwing an open container, AKA beer bottle with beer in it at my person was a mistake. A mishap, and I should be more optimistic and forgiving. You know, like Jesus, or some subservient and obedient Negro. Some sub subservient and obedient Negro who should know his place. Crime number two, drinking and driving. I would have lost everything because of one of those black thugs endangering the good white people of this great town where no one else ever would do that, drink and drive. Alas, some others did do the very thing I, black like me, was on the other side of it and had to, and had to have been a mistake. Yes, I am not ashamed to tell you that I cursed that police officer off, out, and I told him to get the fuck off of my porch. He got defensive, he huffed and puffed about how he's not the enemy. His own words, I'm not the enemy. I said to him, yes you are, if you're going to stand here and try and convince me that this could simply could have only simply been an accident. You most definitely are a part of the problem. In fact, you are part of the foundation of the problem.
So then I'm back to writing to my friend and I said, I cannot go on, on any longer. I have an intensely high number of extremely important things to do. I will leave you with this. If you cannot stand up for what is right and you are white, all inclusive, you are racist. All racists aren't or not, that's it, are not, all racists are not malicious in a tangible way. All racists do not wear hoods, sport hateful tattoos, or do prominent salutes to white power. But I tell you, if you cannot see that my treatment and level of injustice, or level of justice, so to speak, is not on the same level as yours, then you are being willfully ignorant and you do not want to see it. I am not trying to diminish you and all of your achievements and how far you have come. So he went on to previously explain how he had been homeless and how he had pulled himself up to be a, be a business owner now. He's a business, business owner here in Logan. And, and I respect that. I'm not trying to diminish him and his accomplishments and how hard he worked to undo all that. There are homeless people, and I, I fed thousands of them here in Salt Lake City. And no more than eight friends of mine at a time, if we had, if I could gather eight friends at a time. We'll go out and feed 400 people at a time in Salt Lake City. With my money. And guess what the population of those homeless people look like in Utah? They don't look like me. They're Caucasian. Some of them very young, runaway Mormons. I talk to them. I talk to them. How did you end up homeless in, in, in this situation? They tell me some of them ran away from the church. Other situations, they came from other states. I talk to those people. That's how I know. So then you are being willfully ignorant and you do not want to see it. I am not trying to diminish you in all of your achievements and how far you have come. I have come a long way too without any zero support from my parents. My father died when I was 14 and we were poor prior to that. After he died, we were destitute. My final year of high school, my mother and I lived in Detroit, Michigan in an apartment and survived off of $333 a month. A month. I could not borrow money from one of my surviving parents if I wanted to, from my one surviving parent if I wanted to. No yearbook money, no high school prom money. I didn't go to a high school prom. No school picture money. No class ring money. And I finally got serious about school my last year because I found hope and self-esteem and finally believed what my mother said I am and what I could be if I worked twice as hard around the obstacles that would stand before me always. 